I'd like to uh, first of all thank uh, the doctors Hoppe for inviting me back to uh, to do this again. I uh, I was thinking earlier that uh, uh, Joe Biden had said that it was the Russians' fault for all the inflation in America, and now uh, Dr. Hoppe has confirmed that it is indeed the Russians' fault. So. Uh, so uh, we can say that uh, Hoppe and Biden are, you know, right, 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 right together. Yeah. How about that? So uh, this will be, uh, I've, I've got this uh, terribly sweet spot in between Sean, Gab, and lunch. And uh, <laughs> mine will be, uh, my talk will be a little bit different. Um, it's called Movements Become Rackets. And uh, it was inspired by a gentleman that I uh, studied under, Murray Rothbart. And a few people in, in the room maybe had the pleasure of meeting Murray um, or working with Murray. Uh, but uh, he wrote a memo to F.A. Harper and George Reich, uh, or Resch, uh, entitled What is to be Done? And uh, a few of us know George. George, uh, we used to call George to buy uh, coins from George when he worked for Bl Bert Blumert. So uh, it is uh, indeed a small world. But uh, the, my story with uh, movements become rackets begins um, not with what uh, Murray talked about, which we'll get to later. But uh, I want to start with the uh, one of our uh, favorite organizations of people in this room, I'm sure the Southern Poverty Law Center. Now, uh, Morris Dees was a, a super salesman and a master fundraiser, and he's uh, the gentleman who started Southern Poverty Law Center. He viewed civil rights work mainly as a marketing tool for uh, bilking gullible uh, northern liberals out of their money. Uh, he told a reporter, we just run our business, our business like a business. Whatever you're selling, cakes or causes, it's all the same. So while he was studying at the University of Alabama in the late 1950s, and oh, by the way, a few of, will, a few of you will remember a certain year when a certain couple were married at this certain conference, and there was a gentleman here by the name of John Denson who actually went to law school with Morris Dees, and he told me he confirmed all of what I'm about to tell you is that during law school, Dees sold Holy Reese birthday cakes, published a student uh, telephone directory, dabbled in real estate. He was just a, I don't know how much law he learned, but he certainly was a very entrepreneurial uh, force at the University of Alabama Law School. So upon graduating in 1960, Dees teamed up with another gentleman named Miller, Millard Fuller, and he went on to form Habitat, Habitat for Humanity. And, but first, they opened a direct mail business in Montgomery. They sold doormats, tra tractor seat cushions. Uh, I don't know when the last time you bought a tractor seat cushion, but uh, cookbooks. And he said, uh, he's quoted as saying, Morris and I, from the first day of our partnership, shared the overriding purpose of making a pile of money. So in 1971, Dees opened the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama, and he was already colorful and controversial in, in uh, that part of the state. And he volunteered to raise money for George McGovern. And this was his first break. Uh, during that ca uh, presidential campaign with McGovern's uh, blessing, he was given a mail list of 700,000 people. And that was to help launch the Southern Poverty Law Center direct mail operations. Now, having been somewhat in the business, I can tell you having a big mail uh, mailing list is uh, the key to raising a lot of money. But you may, you may think Southern Poverty Law Center now that means these guys are 
Now they're helping poor people out who are having trouble in the legal system, right? Well, that didn't raise much money. So they, they abandoned the whole property law thing to raise money off fighting the Ku Klux Klan and getting money from liberals up north. So they dropped the, southern, uh, the poverty center, they stayed in the south, um, forgot poverty, and went into the, uh, the hate business, essentially. Now, the center had accumulated an, an endowment topping $120 million. And they paid lavish salaries to high-ranking staffers, uh, and they, while at the same time spending far less on, than most nonprofit groups on the work that it claimed to do. At the same time, Dees, he started earning a reputation for hitting on young female staffers. That is a hint for things to come throughout this presentation, hitting on young female staffers. So, in fact, the Southern Poverty Law Center College used to tell jokes that about when they would, uh, they would go by the center's uh, Maya Lin designed memorial to Southern rights mar martyrs. They'd cast a glance at the inscription from Martin Luther King etched in black marble until justice rolls down like waters. Except they would say in their deepest voices, until justice rolls down like dollars. Now, the Law Center was, had a way of turning idealists into cynics. Like most liberals, their view of the, SL, or the SPLC before they arrived had been shaped by the often uh, cited listings of U.S. hate groups that the Southern Poverty Law used to put out, its reputation for winning cases against the Ku Klux Klan, the Aryan Nations, and its stream of direct mail pleas for money to keep the good work going. The mailers in particular painted a vivid picture of a scrappy band of intrepid lawyers and hate group monitors working under constant threat of death to fight hatred and injustice in the deepest heart of Dixie. But this all took place in downtown Montgomery, Alabama, in this modernist glass and steel building that uh, uh, James Howard Kunstner, who you may have read if you read if you read LewRockwell.com, he later called it the Darth Vader Building, which made social justice look despotic. He said, and of course there was security everywhere. And in fact, one veteran staffer told a, a, a writer for uh, the New Yorker who worked there briefly, a guy named Bob Mosier, well, honey, welcome to Bo Poverty Palace, she called it. I can guarantee you that you will never step foot in a more contradictory place as long as you live. Now, Mosier wrote in the New Yorker, after he'd worked at S uh, SPLC, the work could be meaningful and gratifying, but it was hard for many of us not to feel like we'd become pawns in what was in many respects a highly profitable scam. And as profitable as it was before, well, when Donna and Melania came Gliding down that escalator in 2015, the money really started rolling in. Because as you know, everybody knows, when Donald took office, it was, you know, hate-a-palooza in, you know, United States. And it opened up the gusher of donations for the Southern Poverty Law Center. They raised $50 million in 2016, they took in $132 million in 2017, and the new money pushed the center's endowment past $450 million, 
which is more than the total assets of the American Civil Liberties Union. And in 2019, they employed an all-time high of 350 staffers. Now, having been in Montgomery, Alabama in the afternoon, I can tell you, that seems like the whole downtown area. <laughs> it's 350 people. But none of this is slackened its constant drive for more money. If you're outraged about the path, of the, the path President Trump is taking, I urge you to join us to fight against the mainstreaming of hate, said one of their direct mail appeals signed by Morris Dees in 2018. Please join our fight today with a gift of 25, 35, or $100 to help us. Working together, we can push back against these bigots. Unfortunately, at age 82, the We Too movement caught up with Morris Dees, and he got canned for um, he continued to hit on female staff members. But the work goes on. The annual hate group list of which there are some groups that people in this room would know about. Um, in fact, in 2018, I had included 1,020 organizations in the United States, both large and small, and this list remains a valuable resource for journalists, and um, it's a masterstroke of Dee's marketing talent. Each year, when the center publishes it, mainstream outlets write about the rising tide of hate in the United States that have been discovered by the Southern Poverty Law Center attorneys. And so the money just keeps rolling in. Well, it's not just the left that has this going on. We've got it on the right. Maybe you've heard of Hillsdale College. Maybe some people in the room have sent money to Hillsdale College. They used to send out this empress thing and, you know, everybody got one. And uh, the guy that really got that geared up was a guy named George Roach III. He's considered one of the great fundraisers in the history of political ideologies. He raised millions to build modern facilities, provide ample student aid to any of Hillsdale's 1,200 students who needed it. And if you didn't see Roach on campus, everybody knew, they understood, he was out raising money to beat back the liberal devils lurking outside of Hillsdale's gates. He's very charismatic. He was considered a conservative celebrity and a hero to the movement. In fact, William F. Buckley called Hillsdale the most prominent conservative college in the country. But one Hillsdale professor said, this man is a phony and a fraud. And a Roach family member explains He's not the type of person that everybody thinks he is. He's kind of like Jekyll and Hyde. He also had a reputation for, and this is a direct quote, a reputation for, for, for possessing a free-range phallus rumored to have visited students and college employees. A free-range phallus. A senior level employee who marveled at Roach's fundraising skill claims to have fled Hillsdale because he suspected Roach was putting the moves on his wife. Roach was considered downright ruthless by those who were unfortunate enough to cross him. Now ultimately, George Roach III, he shocked Hillsdale by uh, divorcing his wife of 44 years. She had cancer, got divorced, he remarried in just five months. 
And that's where the story gets really interesting. His daughter-in-law, Lisa, who's married to George IV, who was a professor at Hillsdale, so this was all a big family business, so to speak, she was very disturbed by the presence of a new woman in her father-in-law's life. Roach was hospitalized with complications from diabetes, and and his distraught daughter-in-law, Lisa, threatened to kill herself in a phone call, conversation with him. So the older Roach's secretary interrupted a class taught by the younger Roach, his son, and told him what was going on. So the younger Roach, George IV, rushed to his wife, Lisa. She's obviously upset. She didn't care what her husband thought. She insisted to go in to see her father-in-law, who was in the hospital, where in front of him, George III, his son, George IV, And his new wife, she blurted out that she and her father-in-law had been having an affair for 19 years. Which the son then asked the father, George IV, asked George III, is she telling the truth or is she having some sort of breakdown? And the younger Roach said, his father didn't say a word. I could tell by looking at him that she was telling the truth. I saw that look in his eyes. He was caught. Lisa, the upset daughter-in-law, as you remember, returned to her campus house after the confession, armed herself with a 38 caliber handgun. She walked out her backyard and through the college's arbiter to a stone gazebo and killed herself. Now, Hillsdale's trustees, they thought George walked on water. I mean, in in other words, he could do whatever the hell he wanted as long as he didn't embarrass the school. But having a 19-year affair with your daughter-in-law and having her commit suicide when it became public, that was too much for them to take. But Roach had hauled in nearly $325 million by the time he had resigned. He increased Hillsdale's endowment from $4 million to $184 million. Students and their parents were worried the scandal might cause donations to drop, that it was crimp Hillsdale's future. Um, it hasn't really happened. Roach resigned after the lover's suicide, and a, remem- uh, a member of the Roach family said that uh, the elder Roach's golden parachute was $3 million. Of course, these days, Hillsdale's making news by cozying up to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Their Christian school has been described as a citadel of American conservatism. Donald Trump has connections there. Ted Cruz and Clarence Thomas have given commencement uh, addresses. And the school has started a series of leadership seminars that sound like right-wing TED Talks. Hillsdale is also a champion of what it calls patriotic education. And that brings us to what Murray Rothbard was writing about Um, And uh, this memo has been reprinted in a book called Strictly Confidential, uh, published by the uh, Mises Institute. Um, And it's probably all still strictly confidential because we can barely give the book away. So, uh, but so you can probably get it cheap somewhere, but there's some fascinating things in there. So, Murray was writing a memo to um, 
Baldy Harper and uh, George Reich. And he was talking about fee founder Leonard Reed, which I'm sure you've maybe heard of if uh, you've been in the uh, freedom movement for very long. He was handsome, charismatic, but in Rothbard's words, Reed was hardly appreciative of scholarship or of the conditions of free inquiry and research. Reed stifled the scholarly and creative productivity of anyone on his staff. Instead, the fee founder increasingly pitched fee publications toward housewives rather than scholars, which immediately tossed away the importance of the pyramid of influence from intellectual to mass. So speaking of housewives, Mr. Reed, who again was remembered as a giant in the libertarian movement, is also known for his prurient interest in housewives. Brian Doherty wrote in Radicals for Capitalism, Sean, you don't need to take notes for this. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Brian Doherty wrote in Dreadlicals for Capitalism that Reed's sexual exploits were allegedly on par with Wilt Chamberlain's. Now, I realize there's very few here from the States, but Wilt was a very famous basketball player. They called him Wilt the Still. Uh, we kind of now realize what the stilt meant. Um, <laughs> anyway, Wilt reportedly bedded 10,000 different women. So the idea that Leonard Reed is in the same ballpark as Wilt Chamberlain is incredible. Now, Murray was a little more delicate. Uh, he was telling uh, Harper and Reich, quote, pure libertarian thought was not only discouraged by Reed, but bitterly attacked. And Doherty explained that Reed just wanted to offer his own way of understanding the freedom philosophy in more of a preacher rather than teacher uh, sort of way. And in this, in this regard, the approach attracted businessmen who could proselytize to their employees. But what Reed did best was raise money while catering to what Rothbard called the high school of liberty. Now Murray wrote to uh, Harper and Reich, uh, it is the thesis of this memorandum that the problem of tactics and strategy for advancement of libertarian individualist cause is of critical crossroads. A crossroads in the historical development of this stream of thought, transcending even the important problems of establishing a possible libertarian institute or of deciding how to rechannel educational funds from various blind alleys into which they have fallen. The fee literature and sticking to general, general, generalities and low-grade generalities at that fell between two stools and therefore has lost influence among both intellectuals and among the mass base. Now Rothbard was in his mid-30s when he wrote this. And he was more concerned um, with such thinking. In, in the Harper Rush memo, he wrote, the danger is less apparent and more insidious, for it is the danger of the hardcore libertarian being swamped by a growing mass of conservative and right-wing thinkers. Reed rationalized the processes of one of training libertarians and then sending them off to do better things, thus functioning as a high school of liberty. He thus ignores the fact that it could have been a lot more, wrote Murray, 
Rothbard wrote that fee served only as a gateway to the libertarian movement and not a libertarian center, let alone scholars forming a libertarian cadre. Rothbard also addressed the influence of the right. The transformation led by the theoreticians of the National Review has transformed the right from a movement that at least roughly believed first of all in individual liberty and its corollary, civil liberties domestically and peace and isolation in foreign, in foreign affairs into a movement that on the whole is opposed to individual liberty, a movement that in fact glorifies total war and the suppression of civil liberties. It also glorifies monarchy, imperialism, polite racism, and a unity of church and state. Unquote. Now, from Fee's launch in March 1946 to the early 1980s, Leonard Reed generated a million dollars a year from some of America's biggest businessmen. Now, a million dollars a year doesn't sound like much, but if you inflation adjust it, that means in 46 he raised the equivalent of $13.8 million. 1980 it would have been $3.4 million, and you can kind of in your head fill in the blanks in between, and it added up to a whole lot of money that Leonard Reed was able to raise creating content for, as Murray says, for housewives. Rothbard finished the section of the memo entitled The Decline of Fee with another danger with the history of fee and other right-wing organization tells us the tendency for the fellow who can obtain money to be in control of policy and the corollary tendency to begin to trim the output of the organization to what will attract the money. When the latter happens, the gathering of money becomes the end, not the means. And the organization begins to take on the dimension of a racket. Morris Dees, George Roach, Leonard Reed provided, proved that Murray was right. Movements ultimately become rackets. Thank you.